part of this Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, at the 10th anniversary of Global Entrepreneurship Week in 2022, celebrating a decade of entrepreneurs. I'm Francois Bonici. I'm the director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. And I'm delighted today uh, to be here to announce and launch uh, our Corporate Changemakers Challenge, which will be in the Uplink Open Innovation Platform of the World Economic Forum. Uh, and with me today, I'm accompanied by Polly Sumner, the Chief Adoption Officer of Salesforce. Salesforce have been a really important partner in getting Uplink started and will be kind of a key partner in leading us on the Corporate Changemakers Challenge. And I'm also joined with uh, Garon Suarez Richard from uh, AXA. She's head of uh, AXA Emerging Markets uh, and a uh, champion corporate entrepreneur herself. Uh, we've known her for some time. And we're just delighted that both of you are here today to help us celebrate entrepreneurs and actually unleash a, a new generation. So a special thanks uh, from all of us at the World Economic Forum and Trump Foundation uh, to our amazing partners in this journey, Salesforce, as I mentioned, but also the League of Entrepreneurs who are hosting us here today. Uh, thanks to the whole team uh, for hosting us for this launch, uh, as well as Unis Social Business, the Circle of Entrepreneurs, Craig Barock, the Aspen Institute, uh, Don Cabral Foundation and the Rutgers Institute of Corporate so Social Innovation. All of these actors coming together to help us use the platform of the World Economic Forum to really bring a spotlight and to add wind into the sails of this movement of entrepreneurship. So um, I wanted to just remind those of you who are on social media and in the audience today, if you're sharing on social channel, channels, you can use the hashtags, hashtag CSI challenge and hashtag GIW2022. So the challenge we launched today really aims to find innovative emerging corporate solutions, many of whom are in today's uh, audience and run by entrepreneurs, because we believe it's a critical tool to create social and economic impact. Why? Because we have seen as the Shrub Foundation, the same purpose uh, driven innovation genes that we've seen for many years in social entrepreneurs also being driven by employees within companies that have the same uh, intensity, same persistence, same uh, 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 concern about the status quo today. Uh, and we believe that uh, as a sister organization of the World Economic Forum, that corporate entrepreneurship can be a critical tool to develop purposeful businesses and drive social and economic impact. So we're gonna hear a little bit today uh, from Polly uh, about uh, creating a culture of innovation uh, uh, for a, a purposeful business. We're gonna hear from Garance uh, a little bit of her journey as a social entrepreneur and who's also been engaged with us at, at the World Economic Forum. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenge uh, 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 that we're announcing today in a little bit more detail. Before I hand over to Polly, I wanted to reflect a bit about this word purpose because we use it uh, quite a lot in, in today's world. However, beyond the rhetoric and the excitement, we also need to start looking at the data and the evidence. So I looked at uh, Professor George Serafim's work. Some of you may know him as at Harvard Business School. Uh, he runs actually a course at Harvard Business School called Reimagining Capitalism. He's also the author of a new book released just a couple of months ago called Purpose and Profit. Uh, when he started his work over a decade ago, uh, the data showed actually an inverse correlation between what investors' uh, confidence and interest in certain companies and, and, and those companies that had sustainability strategies. In other words, they were actually turned off by the sustainability plans of companies. That has changed over the last, uh, over the last 15 years or so to a point where there's now becoming a positive correlation between both obviously investor and customer interests in the sustainability efforts of, of, of companies. So there's now strong hard data to also demonstrate uh, why the, the efforts towards ESG uh, is starting to have a positive influence on business performance. However, the box ticking exercise uh, and the basic hygiene elements of building ESG uh, metrics and ESG activities isn't sufficient for the big challenges we have in the world. And so what Professor Serafim and his uh, colleagues have done is also look into what are the key efforts of ESG and driving those into strategy and not merely standard ESG practices. And he has five recommendations. I'm going to talk through them to you and show why they're necessary uh, and interesting for entrepreneurs. 
So the first he says, identify the material issues in your industry and develop initiatives that set your firm apart. Create accountability mechanisms and ensure the board's commitments. The third point is critical. Infuse the whole organization with a sense of purpose and enthusiasm for sustainability and good governance. Decentralize ESG activities throughout the operations and communicate regularly and transparently with employees, investors, and customers. So these elements identifying what Professor Seraphim wants to identify is which companies are going to be competitive in the future based on their purpose. And ultimately, they've looked at you know, more than 4,000 companies globally and looking that while ESG practices are converging, what's starting to differentiate firms is those that are putting ESG into strategy. Uh, ultimately, coming back to what does he define as purpose, because there is no single definition, but through all of this research and through this book, they've identified purpose being as how employees, the people who know the organization best, perceive the meaning and impact of their work. That's ultimately what it boils down to. I thought this was fascinating in terms of what we're talking about today. And uh, uh, what's critical for employees to have that meaning and purpose in their work is also the support uh, of business leaders. And so I wanted at this point uh, to, to talk about entrepreneurship uh, and the culture of innovation for a purpose within Salesforce. Uh, Polly, it's a delight to have you here. We uh, have known about the work uh, and uh, the entrepreneurial talent and culture within Salesforce for some time. In 2019, Rob Acker was one of our first inaugural awardees as a corporate social entrepreneur. But what we've learned you know, through this relationship is how many other it, amazing initiatives have emerged from, from this company. Um, you've had this incredible career uh, now as Chief Adoption Officer at Salesforce. Tell us a little bit around how uh, Salesforce manages to foster this culture of innovation for a purpose. Sure. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having us. I'm super excited about this challenge. And um, I certainly uh, believe that um, Uplink is a great platform and the community and um, stakeholders that are represented in the World Economic Forum can have a very positive um, effect, not just on sponsoring um, entrepreneurs, but also lending their full power to those entrepreneurs in order to get those ideas, those uh, innovations out into the market or into their own businesses to have a better impact on something like sustainability, as you mentioned. Now, I've been in the tech industry for 40 plus years, and it's an industry that, quite frankly, is built on innovation new business models and talent. That's like the three legs of the stool that are super important for every successful tech company. And we are grateful and also um, fortunate enough that the tech industry is nurtured, it's inspired, and it's funded by an entire ecosystem. And I think that's what we're trying to create here, maybe with a different twist. Now, today, companies need to take an active role to find solutions to the challenges we all face in today's world and in tomorrow's world. And we need to do it in a way that also supports inclusion, equality, and sustainability. And what I just said to you is exactly the way we feel at Salesforce, that it's important for everybody in our company and our customers, our partners, and individuals to lean in to this um, motion of innovation because <clears throat> that's the way we're going to get ourselves out of the mess we've created over the past 50 years. Now, at Salesforce, innovation is one of our core values, and it has been since the very beginning. And um, as I mentioned, we encourage every employee, partner, customer, and individual to foster innovation. But how do we do that? It's one thing to have the word on the wall when you walk in a building. It's another thing to build a culture that so your guests can taste it and feel it. And it's a third thing to provide the recognition, the nurturing, and quite frankly, when it doesn't work, the empathy and compassion around uh, failure. Because if you don't try things, then you're not going to come up with anything that's innovative. Just doing things the same old way doesn't yield a different result. <laughs> so... Um, one of the examples of this is uh, a program that we call Trailhead. Now, we didn't like invent this ourselves. We actually went out and we started to hear in the market a couple of things. 
One was a requirement of us as a business when our customers were saying to us, where are all the skilled people that know Salesforce? Salesforce, you've been growing really fast. We love your products, but we need people that know how to teach the rest of our company how to use them, how to get value from what we're doing. We had a second piece, which was the world changed and nothing changed it faster, even though it had already started than COVID where everybody had to be reskilled and we all learned a new way of working and working from home. New ways of communicating, collaborating, all kinds of new systems. The innovation has just been amazing. Now, <clears throat> um, the third thing is, is that we heard that people wanted to join the tech industry. The tech industry was super exciting. Now, whether you were a young person or maybe a person who came back from, um, in many cases, maybe you were a veteran in the United States or you had retired from a position, you still have a lot more to give. So it wasn't focused on a specific age, was focused on a need, a desire, a sense of purpose, wanting to give more. And when we started to put all these things, things together with some really smart people in our company, we came up with an idea that what if we made learning free and what if we made it fun and what if we made it kind of gamified, but serious? Could we help people find jobs? Could we help companies uh, find the employees that they wanted with the right skills? Could people that were maybe stuck in a dead end job or didn't think they would be able to join the tech industry, what could we do to inspire them and to nurture them going forward? So we created badges, which are certifications that kind of accredit the person who's completed that online course. So people can see that it's visible, that they can see that this person has credentials that they might be interested in. So we tried to stimulate that, so to speak, from the inside of Salesforce. But something remarkable happened. And the remarkable thing was, was that the participants started giving back immediately. When they got a new job, they set up little communities in their companies or in their um, communities. And they started to run Saturdays, Saturday classes for people where one person would help another person who was struggling with the principles of good UI design or development, or maybe wanted to know how to be a social marketeer. Then we <coughs> created paths or journeys, we call them trails, our, our sort of word is trailblazer and trailhead. And we went to the partner community and we said, hey, if a person has gone on this trail, isn't it as good as having completed a course at a university or maybe gotten a diploma in something? Because we're trying to democratize the use of IT. And that happens faster in a consumer world than it does in um, the business world. So putting all that together, we published um, and put together uh, different trails that people could follow in order to meet the requirements of um, the new digital world. And those might be people who use Salesforce in marketing, sales, service, data analytics, AI, integration, the list is almost endless. Our customers wanna hire these trailblazers and they wanna build a team of trailblazers in their own companies with existing and new skills, fostering innovation together um, in order to uh, achieve their objectives. So it's kind of a, a circular system that keeps paying back. <clears throat> and that kind of innovation, I think, or that is an example of how innovation can be fostered. <clears throat> Excuse me. We feel that by joining <clears throat> together with Deloitte and the forum, and using the Uplink platform that we can expand this and unlocking the entrepreneurial spirit and fostering innovation together in companies across the globe. Innovation for social good and corporate good go together and they're inclusive of all stakeholders and that's our goal and the purpose of this challenge we're sharing with you today. Thanks so much, Polly. And you know, you've given us one example of trailhead, you know, that really was was important for people that <coughs> either didn't have skills or were looking for skills to actually, you know, build a marketplace for that. I just come from uh, New York, where also the the Net Zero marketplace was also launched by Salesforce together with some partners of ours as well, uh, South Pole Group, etc. 
uh, not only has Salesforce, I think, had you know that internal innovation around you know its own its own business, but also you know increasingly around uh, social and environmental goals that we all face. But also now, I think, with the Uplink platform, is interested in in making sure that all companies you know can can build their own cultures to do this, um, with the belief that 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 you've done it. So, uh, thanks again for uh, the the partnership. Uh, and for uh, you know getting us going uh, in today's uh, launch, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the the Uplink platform, uh, which had started two years ago. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, ask uh, our team here to share a short video that will go out on the social media accounts today uh, across the World Economic Forum platforms with its kind of tens of millions of viewers across the world. Uh, so it's trying to explain entrepreneurship in a very short way. Uh, and so for the for the experts here, uh, they, they may get frustrated with the, some of the definitions, but I think what's more important is that we're trying to mainstream this movement or entrepreneurship, allow any employee who's working in their companies to feel uh, legitimacy, to have an opportunity to get visibility through this platform uh, and to get excited about the what they can do in their place of work. So um, Fred, maybe if you can, you can show the video uh, and then I'll talk a bit more about the challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, great. So you got a taste of what uh, the Uplink platform uh, is. It's an open innovation platform uh, built by the World Economic Forum, Salesforce, uh, and Deloitte, uh, launched in the annual meeting in Davos in 2020, two years ago. Uh, and uh, up until now, uh, it has been a open innovation platform for entrepreneurial solutions. Together with these partners, many of which have been working in entrepreneurship for many years, we're using it for the first time to really pilot a challenge to identify entrepreneurs, given we're uh, at a network uh, of many of the world's top companies who are partners and members of the World Economic Forum. If we can move on uh, to the next slide. To show you in two years, uh, this incredible uh, crowdsourcing platform has identified uh, more than 3,800 uh, solutions it has almost 50,000 users looking at the solutions that are emerging. It has uh, done this through 30 innovation challenges and identified 200 top innovators out of those solutions uh, and created an ecosystem in which more than $400 million uh, has been received by entrepreneurs, partly through their visibility and network and partnership of this platform. Uh, it's all been focused around the sustainable development goals as part of a, um, a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations to really gear the private sector towards a sustainable development agenda. So it's a really powerful platform that's been growing very rapidly in the last couple of years. And uh, today we're excited to see, can we link this platform with uh, the, the, the purpose uh, of the World Economic Forum's vision around stakeholderism and stakeholder capitalism? So let's move forward uh, to the next slide. We're going to be dive right in and look at you know why and what will we be looking at uh, as in this challenge specifically around corporate social entrepreneurship. It's clear, and I don't need to necessarily explain to this community here kind of why entrepreneurship is this potentially powerful tool to drive inclusive and sustainable business. 
Uh, we want to bring this to the world and allow uh, anyone, any employee anywhere in the world who is working on an initiative within their company that is core to the business or de delivering and demonstrating business value, but also starting to work towards and demonstrate social environmental impact. In particular, we're interested in advancing social environmental equity uh, while increasing value for the business. Let's move forward. It will have three key focus areas, inclusive and sustainable value chains. So we're interested obviously in what's happening through value chains and supply chains in the world, uh, increasingly becoming more competitive, but also ensuring social environmental sustainability. The other focus area is inclusive access. So uh, models, products and services that can really guarantee uh, the inclusive uh, opportunities, uh, rights uh, and dignity. Um, and of course, inclusive finance and income generation uh, as a really important, powerful tool uh, for driving equity in the world. And we'll talk a little bit about that now. There is a fourth category, uh, which is a little bit more open for any inclusive uh, business uh, opportunity that is driving equity that may not fall very neatly into any of these categories. We really want to be broad and inclusive at this point uh, and, and use this platform to bring visibility to entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. Ultimately, what we'll be able to do, so we will, any, any entrepreneur uh, that, that chooses to submit an initiative uh, on the platform will get public exposure. There will be uh, visibility for, for all initiatives that are genuine and, and obviously verified. Um, uh, and uh, what we will do then is with the top 10 to 15 uh, innovations and entrepreneurs, we will provide further visibility on all of the forum uh, and Shrub Foundation's channels access to selected uh, initiatives, uh, projects, communities within the World Economic Forum and within Salesforce, uh, connections uh, to our partners, uh, and of course, visibility internally inside the company itself. And that's often one of the key uh, opportunities uh, for entrepreneurs is to get the visibility and support of their business leaders. And ultimately, uh, mentorship opportunities, depending on the, the challenge that they might be facing uh, where they are in their journey. Uh, we can end uh, there. That gives you a bit of a flavor of uh, what we're talking about today. We'll uh, post uh, you know, in, in all of the live stream channels the links uh, to this challenge. Uh, it'll be live from today uh, for the coming weeks. Um, I, I wanted to just reflect a little bit on what Polly had started to talk about, which was you know, providing opportunities openly for uh, uh, anyone in the world to really access their technology and build their own skills uh, and find a route uh, uh, to economic uh, independence uh, and livelihood for themselves. Uh, someone else, uh, and really delighted here to welcome in uh, Garance um, to talk about her work in AXTA. Uh, Garance, uh, you're uh, always quite modest about your work, but ultimately, you know, you built AXTA Emerging Customers uh, in 2016. Um, and you'll tell us a little bit about that. I don't want to take it away uh, from you, uh, your story. Uh, but uh, this has been, you know, both a revelation in terms of driving inclusive access in particular for women um, and also demonstrating to the company how this was a whole new business opportunity that was also at its core driving inclusion and impact. Uh, welcome today. Uh, of course, we're always delighted to, to see you again. Uh, you've been part of the Shrub Foundation and World Economic Forum communities now for almost three years, uh, and really just a pleasure to, to have you with us today. Tell us a little bit about the, 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 the AXA emerging customer story and, and your journey. Thank you so much, Francois, and it's always a pleasure and honor to be invited, um, because I have to say my sort of uh, participation in, I would call it the momentum that you create, you and your teams, because it's very much that. To me, one of your deliverables, so to speak, is momentum. Uh, and it's very hard to quantify, right? But it's very important. And so it must seem frustrating sometimes for you because so many companies, especially with the, in, within the interpre entrepreneurial world, I guess, says that say that um, what isn't measurable doesn't exist. But I actually, to a certain extent, don't agree with that uh, because all the seeds planted. I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, last night. <clears throat> and I was talking actually to my family about it. And I was saying, you know, they did this. And, and I think that if I hadn't met this person, 
I wouldn't have done that. And also they challenged me in New York uh, in September 2019 on a particular point, et cetera. And I, it's funny because then I started, I took a piece of paper that was just like a scrap piece of paper on the table from, um, from one of my daughter's homework uh, exercises. And I started writing down um, everything that, that was directly helpful to me uh, and, 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 and momentum driving from uh, the Schwab uh, initiative, but also uh, uh, the UNOS social business, but also the unusual pioneers, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I started writing it down. It's like when you don't stop, when you're writing a dissertation. And then I thought this brought this, brought this, brought this. Actually, I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, so, so when it started, in a way, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, um, which maybe is one of the key success factors, I don't know, some form of uh, candor. Uh, I, I, I don't think naivety is the word, but um, a sort of um, almost irrational conviction that we don't have much of a choice and that it's such an unbelievably good idea. Uh, and, and although, uh, you know, my grandfather always said to me, you know, God gave you two, two, two ears and one mouth, so use that ratio. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you shouldn't listen too much, or at least uh, not to everyone all the time. I think uh, what helped me is at one point I decided that I wasn't very, very strong on insurance in the sense that what I had been doing in AXA was on the um, margin of insurance. I worked for a long time in the asset management business at AXA. And then I worked on social media and, and became head of external comms, which I loved, but I, I had no expertise in that. And then, you know, you're on this, you have a blank page in front of you. And, and I think one of the things is to decide to go for it, um, even if you don't know if you're right, All right? So, that's one success factor. The other one is choosing the first person who's going to work with you. Because you, it's very difficult to do it completely alone. You have to at least start two people by being two people, uh, at least. But two people is actually a good number for a few months, right? Because your sparing partners, your uh, comforters, your challengers, whatever it is, um, you're, you're very, it has to be very complimentary. So in my case, I, I recruited someone who was very, very young. <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, at the time, he was 23 years old. And so I, I met him at, for an internship uh, in my team and I thought, you're just perfect. So we, we built this together. And I think that when it comes to entrepreneurial, uh, this is maybe a big difference with entrepreneurial approaches. Um, because you have to take into account the politics and, and the different forces that exist, the level of risk, I mean, I'll wake up every morning thinking, well, less and less because our CEO is very convinced now and is a real visionary, but thinking I could get my budget cut, right? Because when there's a crisis, an inflation crisis and a war crisis and a climate crisis, then, you know, uh, we're focusing on the real issues in a, in a big company like AXA. So is this going to be on the margin? Is the budget going to be cut? But still, I don't wake up, I don't think with the same sort of snotted stomach that a lot of entrepreneurs wake up with because in the beginning, they don't know if the next day they'll exist and they still have to make commitments to people to work for them, et cetera, with them. So, so, so we were the two of us. And what we've, we've put together is a sort of, um, it's a business that aims to protect those that are too rich to be poor uh, and too poor to be rich, which I've said many times. And, and I think in a way the biggest difficult, so as we've said before with Francois, the biggest difficulties are internal. And I think that this type of platform and open platform uh, and, um, and sort of challenge and collaboration with an organization such as the Schwab Foundation can help a lot in that. Because these internal problems uh, end up pushing an, um, a feeling of, of solitude. And I think that I've heard a lot of people bring us answers in, in that respect. And what Polly said also is, is great because you see, took me much, much more time to come up with that answer than it did Salesforce. Maybe it's because I'm, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm blonde, I don't know what it is. But I mean, when she did, when you described Polly that what you did was basically 
find a way without telling people that that's what they were doing. You were saying you, you made them through your approach, force the company to start becoming inclusive by design. And it's, it's a hard equilibrium, right? Because you want the whole company to be inclus socially inclusive by design. You want the whole company to be green and environmentally uh, friendly by design. But then, you know, there's also a core business, right? And so there's an equilibrium to find there, but it is the small streams that make the big rivers, et cetera. And I think the approach of Salesforce is really the best one I've heard in a while. We've done it upside down in Access that I started with this business. We now represent 10% of, of, of Access client base. Um, and the model is very different, but we did it by slowly, slowly, slowly iterating on small innovations and, 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 and opening doors that were shut in our face and we opened them again. So it's about obviously never accepting no as the end of the conversation, but understanding for each of the entities and the balance sheet or however you call it, or the PLs that are going to need to implement what you're pushing them to do, to see an, an alignment of interest. And that's where I think Polly's point about inclusive by design is, is great. So just to finish, what I would really like to labor here, and I could, uh, because I'm, I love being part of this group, but what I would really like to labor here is maybe something that seems like a detail, but it's very important. On the uplink, uh, more entrepreneurial angle of things, and uh, that's been going on for a few years. I, I went to look at it after our discussion, Francois and Frédéric, uh, yesterday, and it's true that a lot of the content there is very climate oriented. And it's normal, right? Because climate is an emergency, right? And, but so is social. But then climate is easy to touch, right? The enemy is very clear and material. So the enemy is CO2 emissions and who's emitting CO2, right? So it's not that simple, but let me caricature. In social, who's the enemy? Inequality, injustice, inflation, I don't, I don't know. So my point is, please, if when you do bring forward these challenges, and I'm actually more than happy to share some lessons I learned the hard way uh, so that nobody does it again, um, try and make the link between the two, because one without the other, um, you know, pushing for climate adaptation through a resilient approach can be very inclusive of a more creation of social value approach. The two go together and we have a responsibility as a group of people who have a certain share of voice to kill those silos. So that would have been my, my one ask beyond, um, beyond thanking you for, for, for everything you do. Thanks so much, Garrison. Thanks for bringing that up. Clearly, you know, very important. And I think, you know, particularly in 2023, we're going to see a lot stronger um, uh, drive towards the sophistication of understanding the, the metrics of the S in the ESG uh, and the efforts that companies, you know, are, need to start developing uh, around that. And we'd love to, you know, uh, bring that to life with real life examples of how companies are doing this. Um, you, I, as always, you've been quite modest. I mean, uh, AXA Emerging Customers, you said, is now 10% of the client base of AXA, which is, I think, on your website says 9.5 million customers. 15 countries uh, delivering uh, those products and services through over 50 partners. You had to kind of probably totally redesign the business model. Uh, and so you've spoken, you know, quite tentatively around the challenges you had in doing that. But I think, you know, the audience too will, will have a sense of kind of how difficult that was in the early days and the persistence you've spoken about. So I, I, I want to open up a short discussion. We just have a few minutes left with both of you uh, to think about you know, what can corporate leaders do to support and unlock this kind of entrepreneurial potential inside their organizations? Polly, uh, you, you sit in one of these leadership positions. Do you, do you have a sense of what you do and what other companies can really do uh, when, when, when employees come up with, you know, perhaps quite radical, even provocative ideas? Yeah, I think the first one is uh, to try to approach with a big beginner's mind. I mean, obviously you have to, in many cases to find the challenge first from the standpoint of what are you trying to accomplish and what do you want to address? And that's a natural process that we all learn in business school or on the job or wherever we learn that. And I think that um, uh, Garance brought that up in her uh, discussion as well. But as leaders, we have to give the voices to the room to be heard. So, you know, we all got, we, 
we know how to organize a meeting and have a debate and have a um, uh, think about a way forward when the objective fits in the confines of the objective that we are trying to solve in the context of business, whether that's better margins, more customers, you know, a different customer experience, something in your supply chain, whatever that might be. And most of those have been driven by economics. So maybe even the first step, which is a very interesting one to try, is to say, what am I going to measure if I'm trying to achieve social impact? Like in our case, we, if in, in just, for example, the trailhead example, we, we keep track of how many people join, how interactive is it, who helps pay it forward or pay it backwards, whichever way you wanna, you wanna think about it. How many people get hired? Do, you have, do we have a strategy for re-engaging somebody who gets halfway through a learning trail and drops out? What happened to that person? So <clears throat> I think there's lots of things that we can measure with technology that are very different than what we learned to measure when we went to college 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So that's one. I think that exercise of defining what does success look like and how do I measure it is, is pretty darn important. And it's probably got some different metrics and different ways of thinking about things than you know we had in the past. I think the second one is something that is about how do you not try to do it alone, which Garance gave some great examples, but actually engage others and be inclusive. And with inclusion comes diversity and with diversity comes innovation. If you're always surrounded by people who think like you or act like you, how can you innovate? Mm -hmm. So those to me are like a, a bit of a continuum, if you will, in the way that we need to um, solve problems. You know, in the old days, we used to say, oh, they're just a bunch of yes men, you know, but that's not, that's not the way innovation happens. And I think that's disappearing from the corporate culture. And then I liked what Garon said about picking something that's big enough that the feeling of purpose can grow. And that's a challenge to kind of say, I don't wanna boil the ocean, but on the other hand, I don't wanna narrow down the possibilities for innovation so small. So I think that balance is super important as well. Garon, what do you think? <laughs> Oh, I agree with everything you said. I don't even have that much to, to, <laughs> to add. Uh, the difficulty is probably linked to the extent to which, and I'm always stuck with this when I'm asked this question, the extent to which the answer is contextual. The answer is very different for each company. Now, of course, there are going to be points in common. A lot of them you've brought up probably about Sometimes getting the CEO or the, the ex-com members, the very deputy CEOs to just almost become as irrational as you in, in a way. And I say that because they're the only ones that can allow themselves to do it. Uh, and the beauty of it is that it's easier to do this than if, if, if I take insurance and I'll go very quickly because I know we're out of time, but okay, so insurance is about risk management, right? And there's not only risks, there aren't only risks linked to the climate and social issues, right? There are lots of risks that are coming about, cyber risks are coming about, uh, a variety of other uh, um, big, large public-private partnerships li risks linked to pandemics. There are a variety of risks that we didn't know about before that are arriving, right? But pushing to innovate uh, on, on, on social, uh, creation of social value and climate has the beautiful element that the bosses cannot say no. Because well, you're gonna say, no, I don't want to contribute to the climate and I don't want to contribute to social value. So in a way you can ride a form of not being dubious, but being questioning on the part of CEOs on this subject, ride that wave because in the beginning they can't socially say no because they either look like they don't care about the climate or a climate skeptical and which, you know, honestly is a dying race, thank God, or they look like they don't care about the development of human beings. They're not allowed to say that, right? So, so, so in the beginning, at least when you 
embark with your idea go for it as as big as you know when i started it was so, so thomas was amazing our ceo and but when i asked for a certain budget because honestly i was on an envelope on i remember i was in my office going how much am i even gonna you know what am i even doing and i asked for a certain number and in half a second he said yes and i thought i'm such an idiot that i didn't ask for like 20 times more that was way too easy because in the beginning the advantage of being in a big company or in a company versus being alone is very much money. Yes, of course, it's shared resources and reach and awareness, et cetera. But in the beginning, that's one of the, the success factors. So I would say ride that as much as you can. And then you'll have, honestly, all the time in the world to prove it. Not 10 years, but you're given that time. Uh, if, you, if you put that together with a, with a dash of irrationality, I would say, or at least of emotion and, and, and taking a lot of risks, which you're lucky enough to be able to do because you're in a big structure. So you're not putting your family at risk. It's easier in that sense. And, and I actually think that the risk landscape is just as complicated. And I remember this when, when Francois and, and, and the team launched the Intrapreneur Award of the Schwab uh, Foundation. I know that there were quite a few uh, voices raised against the idea by entrepreneurs because they felt that um, the difficulty was not comparable in being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. And I have to say, I agree, but it's not comparable in nature. I actually think it's comparable in, 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 in intensity. It's just that we don't wake up every morning being worried. And that's our personality. I, for example, have a lot of admiration for entrepreneurs. I could not do it. I, I don't even, it's not in my personality. I don't have that skill set. And I admire them like there's no tomorrow. But there are other levels of difficulty, right, within a company. I think if we leverage them correctly, um, because it's, it makes things easier, to be honest, in the beginning. It's about scaling and, be, and being sustainable and still getting the budget that's hard. In the beginning, I think it's a little bit easier. We have to leverage that. And everything Polly said, I'm going to copy <laughs> a lot of things you said because I hadn't thought of it in that way. And I think it fits well with AXA, but I would also be happy to share uh, again the mistakes i made a lot of mistakes in the beginning I, i'm still making them thank god but in the beginning it was like I, when i think back i can't believe of some of the things <laughs> i actually did but um I, I i think it's really worth it um and 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 i'm happy to to contribute as much as i can to to to, to whatever is being done on this uplink platform Op open knowledge anyway is the word is the way forward Thanks, Carlos, for being so open and also honest and frank with, you know, where you are and humble as always, uh, despite the kind of fiery ambition that we all uh, see. Uh, we just have two minutes left. So I actually had a final question, maybe just for Polly uh, to wrap up. You know, we, we talk very much about the private sector, but actually doing this work uh, involves working with many other uh, stakeholders who've been doing the work, looking at social environmental progress for, for decades uh, themselves. So what can companies learn as they move towards more purposeful business? What can they learn from the models and actors uh, who've been working uh, in the social environmental sectors, uh, particularly perhaps around you know, inclusivity? You're on mute for your final question. Excuse me about that. Um, one day I'll learn. Um, so uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, go off your own skills and go off your own capabilities. Most of these big corporates, for example, that belong to the forum, they're an anchor company. They employ thousands of people. They support the communities that they work in. They support the communities that are in their remote locations. They help grow markets in other geographies. So they have a lot of this kind of fundamental platform power, I guess, and reach. And um, so maybe making a, a list of what those things are is one. The second one is, if you believe that there's an area of crisis, I can just tell you a personal story. You know, we have had some crises in, in school systems in Northern California and San Francisco, where I happen to live and where Salesforce is headquartered. And, um, you know, Mark didn't just sit around and wait. He went down to the local school, knocked on the door and said, what can I do to help? And then he asked all of us to go have that same experience in whatever community we lived in. 
And when I say all of us, 250 leaders at the top of Salesforce in every country we participate in the world in every city. And we did. And we found that there's organizations that don't have scale. They just are focused on one little school or maybe three schools. And so we then assigned schools or people could pick. And today there's five, six, maybe 700 different schools that are now supported by Salesforce through a network of our own leaders leading externally for social impact. Most of them are quite frankly not where our children went to, went to school because we're really focused on that middle school where the highest dropout rate is. Um, you know, that's where the, the change occurs that makes somebody say, I don't wanna complete high school. Um, but it's worked out and it's one of the best things that our teams do together um, around the world. And they aren't all in the same department. They're not in the same silos. They're just dedicated to one thing and that's making the schools better in Paris or in you know uh, Geneva or in London or the South End or Indiana or wherever it might be. And um, that workforce came from the CEO <laughs> and saying, here's the room to do that. Super, it, it reminded me a little bit of Garance's story from her grandfather, which was, you know, use our two ears first uh, and listen, and then, you know, the hand that we have uh, to, to support. So um, I just wanted to thank uh, you both for, for coming today uh, and for sharing with us uh, a little bit of uh, the story that, uh, you know, that happened with inside companies that are on this journey towards being more purposeful and dedicating their resources. Uh, but importantly, uh, I wanted to come back to what I had started with, that actually the, the definition of purpose was around employees feeling uh, and understanding the meaning of their work. And I think that's you know, going to be a key driving force for the future. And that's what we want to do is use our two years to listen to entrepreneurs that are out there uh, and provide this platform of Uplink and the World Economic Forum to, to really showcase uh, the incredible work entrepreneurs are doing across the world. So with great thanks and privilege to be here at Global Entrepreneurship Week uh, to get this all started, do please go to the challenge, uh, submit your ideas, spread the word amongst others. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to engaging uh, and hearing from entrepreneurs around the world. So with uh, a big thanks to uh, today's uh, special guests and to the, all the teams uh, at Salesforce and all of our partners uh, here uh, signing off, uh, please join us on the Corporate Changemakers Challenge. <laughs>